Good morning, everybody. Jeff Rediger. I'll, uh, I uh, apologize for the late start here. That, that one's on me. Terry was ready and prompt, and I wasn't. But we're ready to go now uh, for time purposes. Uh, number one, go to mute or listen only. Uh, that, uh, that helps Terry as far as background. Uh, the second button next to the phone button, if you have a question as Terry's going through the presentation, uh, type it in there, and we'll address it as we go through. If we have time, at the end, we will open it up for questions. So with that being said, Terry, uh, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, Jeff. This is the fedresource.us homepage. Uh, as I've been training you, I've been directing you here to take our federal employees to the ssa.gov and tsp.gov websites. So this morning, I just want to refresh everybody's memory quickly on how we get there uh, by taking them through fedresource.us. You're building your branding. So, Jeff, if you'd hover over retirement and drop down to TSP login, please. This is where if you've got a prospect and they do not have the information available for a TSP for you, you can bring them right to this Access Your Account page. Uh, the value of this page is if they forgot their account number or user ID, they can request it. If they forgot their password, they can request it. If they've never been on this website, they can set up an account and retrieve their TSP statement. If you hit the worst case scenario and they have to request to reset their password, you're looking at 10 days snail mail to get a piece of paper in the mail with the ability for them to go online to reset up their account to pull that statement for you. When we're running the Fed benefit analysis reports, uh, these are estimates. So if they've got the last quarter statement and they don't have the ability to pull down the most recent, we can at least work off of that last quarterly statement build in the deposit since, and get a close guesstimate. So this is where we'll take them to help them get their information. Jeff, if you'd go up to the top right and hit the home button for me, please, in the TSP. Above oh, the browser. sorry. I'm still not away. My bad. Okay. i gotta, I got to get it together today. I'll talk it through. Okay, okay. go to home, please. Here on the home page is where I've taken many of you to locate your investment funds data. Now, if you're not securities licensed, obviously, uh, you have to be a little careful here. But I have directed most of you, and this will just be a quick refresher, is to get rates of return, and I'll encourage you to print these forms off so you have a rough estimate of what's going on in the world of the TSP. Just under the brown toolbar is the green arrow that says investment funds. If you click on the monthly returns, down one, there you go, Jeff. This particular page is going to give us what's going on in these funds in a monthly basis throughout the course of the year. I would advise you to scroll up to the right, hit the print this page. I like to do this on a monthly basis and keep my returns as accurate as possible. Now, if you want to look at annual returns, just to the left of the um, rates of return chart is the annual return. And so here we'll have the annual return. And if you'll scroll down quick, Jeff, so we can see the tenure. When we're running reports for you, we're guessing or we're trying to be a point or two under these tenure compound rates of return to give us a conservative estimate of what's going to happen in the TSP. You'll notice on the annual returns, this is just the individual 10-year summary. And so if you go to Select Funds to View, just to the right of the dot where it says Individual Funds, you'll see L Funds since inception. Would you click that right there? Now we'll see that the L Funds have been around since 2005. They have retired the L2010, uh, that is no longer, and they've just created the L2050. So 
So you've got L income through L2050. If you'll scroll up to the top, Jeff, of the uh, blue toolbar where it says Forms and Publications. Perfect. Under Forms and Publications, if you'll scroll down just a little, Jeff, as you're getting started in the federal space, there's fund fact sheets at a glance for each fund, G, F, C, S, I, and L. And to learn about the funds, I would encourage you to uh, click on those PDFs, print them off, and add them to your TSP binder. Now, from time to time, we're going to need to do some service work for our clients, and you can browse by topic. So if they have to change their name, they just got married, they have to change their address, um, they have to update their beneficiary, this is where you will find all of the paperwork that you are going to need to assist your federal employee, right down to age-based in-service distributions, withdrawals, and so on and so forth. I would encourage you to spend some time on this website and get yourself familiar with what uh, the website has to offer as tools to help your federal employee. Let's go to the TSP Matrix page now, Jeff. This is a quick overview page as you're getting started in the federal space that will help you familiarize and have a quick reference to what these funds are invested in, the risk tolerance, their volatility, the types of earnings, the administrative expenses, and when that fund was incepted. So, here again, um, after the call, if you would like the materials that we're going to go over now, uh, we'll have Joy send these materials out to you. I would encourage you to just have this quick one-page snapshot. Uh, it's nice when you're on the telephone having a conversation. The next piece of information that I want to get into your hands is the annual limit on elective deferrals. And we're going to go through that quickly. Um, this is a nice piece here again that you could put in your binder that will give you easy access should a question come up regarding the TSP. What is the annual limit on the elected deferrals? In 2014, it's going to be the same as 2013. It's going to be $17,500. And so you'll see what's the annual limit on elective deferrals. What happens to the agency matching when the annual limit has been reached? Uh, basically, if there are no employee contributions in the pay period, there is no agency matching. So we want to make sure that our federal employees have split their 17500 over their 26 pay periods and not overfunded too much in the beginning so that the agency continues to match throughout the year. What you've got here is the worksheet that will tell them what they should be doing on a biweekly basis so that they don't overfund too soon. The agency does a 1% contribution when the employee um, comes to work for them. So whether they're making any contributions or not, we're going to see that happening. Does it make a difference? Uh, we've talked over that. If they meet, reach the limit too soon, they're going to run into problems. The participation in the TSP and in another tax-deferred retirement plan, uh, you can go ahead and read that on your own. I wanted to make sure you had that just in case. And if they overfund for some reason, they have till April 15th of the following tax year to square that away and, and get the funds out of the account. So that's a very quick overview of the annual limits and deferrals. I do want to hit how the federal government makes its contributions uh, to the federal employees TSP. First and foremost, there's the 1% salary um, that will start immediately when they're hired. I have had a couple 
of the advisors say, hey, they don't have a TSP, but when they go back in and do some research, this 1% uh, most likely assigned to the G fund has been accumulating for that federal employee. On the federal employee's pay, the first 3% is matched dollar for dollar. So the first three, dollar for dollar, percentages four and five are 50 cents on the dollar. And so that's how we get the 5% match when that federal employee starts. The match is vested after a three-year period. Interestingly enough, you may have a CSRS individual contributing to the TSP, and they are not receiving any form of match. It would be my suggestion that you talk to them about alternative strategies where they might be doing some guaranteed step-ups on a, a monthly basis with a fixed equity indexed annuity or a securities product that might give them more opportunity as there is no match. The next brochure that we're going to go to is the Catch-Up and Contributions brochure. And as we all probably know, they must be 50 years old on December 31st of the year that they're doing the catch-up. They must currently be obviously in pay status, and they must be making maximum contributions to their TSP. That's 17500 And they can get, in 2013, uh, 5500 additional dollars put in to the system, into the TSP. And they do not receive any matching contributions on catch-up. They have to use their salary. They cannot use any incentive pay or bonus pay to be included in any of the makeup contributions. So we'll get these forms out to you. So if you're assisting them with setting up an additional 5,500 deposit, the form uh, TSP 1-C, or if they're going to undo the catch-up provision, it'd be TSP U-1-C. So. Uh, that will all be in your brochure there. The next item that I want to show you is the actual age-based in-service withdrawal request form. Many times when we're filling out these forms for the first time, uh, we miss a pretty critical spot that will kick this rollover request um, out the door and you'll have some service work to get things moving again. So Section 1 is basically the civilian, the person that works at the VA. It's their last name, first name, middle initial, if they have one, their TSP account, date of birth, and daytime phone number. The amount for Section 2, what are they requesting as a withdrawal? In this case, 150000 I don't know many advisors that would roll the entire vested amount in an in-service distribution. The next section in the rollover that we would be concerned with is Section 5, and that's a certification and notarization. So they must get this form notarized. So Section 12, uh, V12 is where they're going to sign in front of their notary and have their notary sign off. The next page of this form is the spouse information. So if they're married, uh, we've got to have their name and TSP account number at top. And we've got to have the spouse's name. The spouse has to sign off in front of the notary. And then we also need the spouse's social security number, uh, box 20. So you don't want to miss box 20, which is the social security number. The third important page of the in-service distribution is the transfer. So up at the top, make sure you get the sample, uh, the employee's name, and here we have sample fed with TSP number. But box 28 is one of the most, can you go to page three, Jeff? Yeah. 
I want to show box 28 is really where most people will create a rejection on this transfer. They will forget to put 100% portion of my withdrawal to the IRA or plan identified in Section 9. So do not forget to put 100% there. Uh, it will kick it back. Uh, transfer information for traditional balance, the account type, traditional IRA, you will have set up where the funds are going to be going. So if it's going to a fixed equity indexed company, if it's going to a mutual fund company, wherever it's going, complete section 3032 and have that ready to go. Section 32, please provide name and mailing address, exactly how it should appear on the front of the check. And then 33 and 34 are actually the certifying uh, person at the transfer company. So just a quick overview, do not miss the 100%. That is the most overlooked. And then spouses not notarizing the spousal area. Now, on age-based distribution, they're entitled to withdraw the vested account balance. They must be moving more than $1,000 of the invested amount. They must be 59 and a half. There's no specific reason uh, that they have to mention in this age-based distribution. If they are not doing a trustee-to-trustee -trustee transfer, they will mandatorily be required to hold 20% of the federal tax. And so that's why we want to do the trustee-to-trustee. -trustee. The spouse has to sign off. And here's the biggie. They can only do one age-based withdraw one time in their career. So you have to know without a shadow of a doubt they have not moved money out via age-based distribution prior. I know of an agent that was moving $350,000, but prior to talking to this individual, the federal employee moved $3,000 one time, and so the 350 dollars uh, rollover uh, was stopped. They were not able to move the 350000 because this is a one-time situation. So my suggestion, if you are thinking of moving a portion, whether it's a large portion, if they've got a large TSP and you want to break it up amongst a couple carriers, you want to move it to a carrier that's going to let you then move some money out again one time. If they have a financial hardship, they can withdraw the employee contribution plus their earnings, and here again, $1,000 must be the minimum. They must have a genuine financial hardship in which um, they can prove, uh, whether it be a negative cash flow, unpaid medical expenses, personal casualties and losses, or legal expenses for separation or divorce. They will be required to withhold 10% for federal tax, and they have... Um, basically time frames in which they can do that. There's really no limit on the hardships but a six-month waiting period between withdrawals. So we did see federal uh, financial hardship loans coming out uh, at a high level during the furlough so folks could make their mortgages and those kinds of things. Let's go to the TSP designation of beneficiary form, Jeff, please. As we're doing well-rounded planning, I hope that all of you on the call today are talking to your federal prospects regarding having their proper beneficiaries in place. Um, I have found um, previous spouses on beneficiary forms and have had to personally assist in updating the beneficiaries. Here again, you can just quickly pull these forms under Forms and Publications at the TSP website. But this is form TSP3, and this is how you'll assist your federal employee in updating their beneficiaries. Uh, we don't really need to spend a lot of time on this form. They give you samples, examples of designating primary beneficiaries. We've all done beneficiary updates. 
but I wanted you to know what the form was and where to find the form. And then there's a checklist at the last page to make sure everything has been done correctly prior to being forwarded to TSP. I know that we have gone through this information quickly, but uh, Jeff, at 925, if we want to open it up for questions. Oh, one more thing I wanted to talk about. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, we have run into federal employees that have Roth IRA assets within the TSP and, and basically have commingled them to some degree uh, with their taxable TSP contributions. And what these federal employees really need to know or to understand is that there are specific guidelines as to uh, when this Roth IRA money is taxable and when it becomes tax free. So if they're under 59 and a half and they're taking payments from the Roth TSP, um, they obviously are going to pay taxes on the growth. If you don't have, if you haven't had the Roth TSP open for at least five years, they're going to pay tax on the growth. And if they are both 59 and a half and they have been in the TSP for at least five years, the growth will be tax-free. But as many of us know, the federal employee may be accessing money out of the TSP at 55 uh, through 59. So we want to be able to give them proper advice on the Roth. And after leaving service, they can roll over the TSP uh, to an IRA in the portion of the TSP to the Roth balance. So it's a little complicated with them at this point. Um, when their systematic investing uh, is going in on a biweekly basis, it's being uh, split between TSP uh, traditional and TSP Roth. Uh, we do have a nice article that I will forward to Jeff uh, that one of our uh, consultants John Grobe put together on August 27 of 2013, which does a nice job of explaining taxes and the Roth TSP. I think there's miscommunication uh, for those 55 to 59 and a half year olds on the tax consequences and withdrawals of their Roth portions. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention on the call today. Okay. At 928, uh, if we want to open it up for a couple questions, we could go ahead and do that, Jeff. Terry, that was great. We made up time. That's like the pilot getting out of the gate a little late, so we're going to make up time in the air. Um, perfect, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm down a little cold, so I apologize, but uh, we will open up to questions right now. Um, Terry, no, I did have a question on the um, on the in-service um, uh, transfers. Um, uh, you know, one thing that's at least I've seen in the articles coming out of the different um, newsletters and media sources of the government that they're they're starting to. They're starting to track, at least make it public, that they're tracking the amount of money uh, that's coming out of the TSP accounts. Um, I'm just curious if anybody's run into some pushback if they transfer a larger amount of, you know, HR getting a hold of a federal employee to ask them what they're doing. Uh, has anybody experienced that yet? Because I, I know on the national level they're they're concerned that the money is leaving in record um, amounts to IRAs and out of the TSP uh, accounts. I don't think that our advisors, Jeff, would be experiencing that because we're moving conservative, fair, ethical amounts. We're not uh, going after the whole TSP by any means. 
Well, I'm just curious from a field standpoint if, sure. if anybody's – I know we had one situation where the advisor was in the process of moving a pretty large amount, and the – I don't know if it was the benefit officer, the retirement counselor, or the agency – reached out to the federal employee and asked them what they were doing, and that really kind of created the seed of doubt in the federal employee's mind. So I just want to make everybody aware of that, that you got to really, like Terry said earlier, be very diligent about what you're doing and understand that, um, you know, the government is pretty much looking for any reason to stop any type of uh, outside activity because, you um, it's just not in the best interest for uh, the government to have um, money moved out. So I was just curious. We do have a question. Um, I agree with Terry, no problems with moving the TSP money. Employees have not been taken aside in any matter for my clients, always leaving money in TSP for in-service withdrawal. Okay, I'm not sure who asked that question, but I'm not, as a second comment, I'm not, I'm not clear on. Okay, uh, Brett, always leaving money in TSP for in-service withdrawal. Um, so you're not pulling out the entire amount when you do an in-service withdrawal. You're always leaving something in there. Correct. Okay, got it. All right, that's confirmed. So, that's a good that's that's a good move. I I think you're you are going to run into some problems eventually if you start getting traction in an agency, and it doesn't take much for the advisor to uh, build a relationship with a couple advocates in an agency. They're like, I need to get my money out of here for somebody, and next thing you know, you've got um, you may create an adversarial relationship with HR, and you do not want to do that. I'd look at it as an opportunity to meet them because um, they're the gatekeeper. So thank you for that feedback. Any other questions? Um, from the From the group. Okay. Yeah, Brett just added a comment that, um, and this is so true, and Terry, you can elaborate on this too, that um, everything is much more centralized now, um, which means that uh, you need to make sure that you're in good standing with everybody. And uh, as you've seen, some of you, but um, more of you will see this, uh, we're getting more and more HR leads and the first year we're going to start doing national uh, web events for human resources because we have enough advisors across the country now. So there will be times that we're going to say, hey, uh, we have an HR person that, that attended this session. And if, uh, if you guys are set up correctly, you're going to have an opportunity to meet these decision makers. So what you've done at the ground floor with um, the federal employees is probably already come across their desk. So it's a make or break for you. We've seen uh, this type of uh, process work very well and really create a, a relationship that creates inbound leads. On the other hand, I've seen this implode around somebody because they weren't prepared, they didn't handle it right, they were, they were sloppy with the federal employees and pretty much shut them out of an agency. Uh, Tim has a question, Terry. Will money move from TSP to IRA before 15 and a half be penalized? Can you say that again, please? Uh, Tim uh, asked if the, the money move from TSP to IRA before 15 and a half be penalized. Yes. You can. Absolutely. So the the other area of caution is if you're working with a federal employee and they're retiring at 55 or 56, and that's a, a separation which would give you an opportunity to do a rollover. But keep in mind, if you do a trustee-to-trustee -trustee transfer of the full amount, you've taken away their ability to access any of that TSP 
until age 59 and a half without being assessed the 10% penalty. So you had better leave proper funds within the TSP so that they can access those prior to age 59 and a half from 55 to 59 and a half is a real touchy area when you're moving money in their leaving service. Very good. Thank you. Um, all right, we've gone five minutes over. Uh, Terry, great job today. Again, everybody, apologize. Uh, we've been up to a late start. Um, that's the exception, not the rule. Um, if Terry... Uh, if Terry is running this herself, he started five, ten minutes early every week, and so it's all on me. But uh, thanks. We got some good information to you today. Uh, rebroadcast will be sent out with the documents that uh, Terry went over. Uh, Joy, later today, and uh, thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Have a good day. All right. Everybody have a good weekend. Thanks.